Can y'all see that screen? Ooh, y'all quiet this morning. So, because we're doing this like this, I want to make sure you understand that I'm going to make this long and unsimplified. I mean, uh, short and simple. Yesterday we went over this in class. So now, let's kind of put this together with a PowerPoint. This is our transformer. Remember, steps down to voltage. Here is our high voltage L1, L2, fan relay, contactor, indoor fan motor, compressor, outdoor fan motor, capacitors, and thermostat. So let's see how this works. First thing, we're going to send power to our transformer. See that? Then, R, which is your power, your hot, goes to red on your thermostat. We'll be discussing exactly what all these mean and what this is coming up shortly in a few more pages. Now, we want to energize the fan relay coil, which is a load. So we take our power, send it through G to one side of the load. The other side of the load comes back as common. Then through Y, R sends power through Y to the contactor coil, and it goes up to the fan relay and comes back as common. Now we're going to get our high voltage going. First thing we're going to do is send power to common on the compressor. Now they're using L2 here. Remember, when it's 120 and 120 to get 240, we can do that. Now, we send the other side to run. And do you remember what's wired in series with start and run? Of course, it's the capacitor. This is not going here, but it is hooked up to run. See that right there? Now we're going to hook up this uh, outdoor fan motor and do the same thing to it and hook up start. So these are hooked up the same way to the same sides of the capacitor. This is what we did on the board yesterday and what we've been looking at since last week. Now here, we're going to take common from L1 because it doesn't matter. It's 120 and 120. And we're going to hook it up like that. Look. Bam. Bam. Done. Alright? So that's exactly how you would hook that up. Don't worry about W and C right now. C is nothing but the other side of the transformer, which is not hooked up like that right now. All right? Any questions about that? Oh, you all quiet today. Now, the next thing I want to go over with you, just to make sure you understand, is your homework assignment right now. You have one. I'll create another one for you. But right now, you have one, not two. You will have two, but right now you got one. Um, I'm not doing the one with the commercial as a group because obviously you can't group together right now without making one another sick. Let's see what we got here. Essay on bimetal devices. That one, you should be checking out because this morning that's what we're going to go over. Bimetal devices will make that easy for you. And you submit that, okay? Don't be unsubmissive, be submissive. Hit the submission button, do what you're supposed to do. Now here, uh, we'll talk about that it's coming up. So I'm gonna get rid of this one with all the commercial. Oh man, we get mad at that. No, just calm down. You'll be all right, I'm gonna give you something equally as important and just as lucrative in the learning experience as possible. So you will have that. Now, I'm not going to sit here and show you YouTube videos because 
But here are some first ones you should watch today. What is bimetal? This guy right here, you should watch that one. It's in topic one. I would also watch the one on ladder diagrams. This is kind of the way they did it. This is a diagram just like this they had during the um, uh, contractors and the journeyman. That's what it looks like. It almost looks exactly like that. All right. Um, so that's about the only videos. Tomorrow I'll probably have to watch a few more videos. Uh, thermocouples and all, but we're not going to get into all that yet. Any questions yet? Ooh, y'all quiet today. All right. So let's get into our first little wiring diagram schematic because I know y'all love them. And I will give you this right now. I will say this to you. You cannot pass these videos I make around and you cannot put them online. Uh, the school, this is called intellectual property. You're paying for it. It belongs to the school and you. Um, you do not pass this online. You do not try to sell it for a lot of money because I know I'm valuable, but don't do that kind of stuff. So anyway, when the chicken was trying to cross the road, now, here, I want to talk to you about something we didn't do yesterday. The first one is the synopsis that looks like this. Does anyone know what a synopsis is? Jeremy? Oh, good answer. Good answer. L1 to TR to 24 volts. <laughs> that, that's a good one. Oh, can you see that? Let me help enlighten you, young student looking to learn. Now, we'll put 24 volts SW to CC, that's the contact to car. Now, this one will have L1 to CC1, normally open to comp. By now, you should know that's a compressor. Let me fix the O so nobody thinks it's a Q. Okay. Is anything misspelled, Bryce? Now here, we have CC2 to L2. All right, that's the second part of this. So you're going to look at this, look at this, and look at this to write the wire diagram. Now who wants to come up here and do it? Ah, nervous, huh? So let's look at this, L1, I know my L1s look like a 4, but deal with it. L2, and we're going to come down to our transformer. Yeah, who's got a question? You texting me? Since this is not live, that's impossible. I have a question. I see homework. I have due this week. But there's not a link to submit it. Would you know... Would you happen to know why? Good question. Now, this one says low voltage transformer. I'll be trying to do homework while I'm uh, lecturing. So the first thing we know is we have what? Two 40 volts and 24 volts. This is a line diagram, okay? Line diagram. Can you all see that? You need more light? Does that help you? Do you know what? Let me look in this thing. Yeah, that looks right. I think you can see the board just fine. Now, uh, this is all my learning material today. Not that. Don't worry about that. That's my, that's my snack. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is L1 to TR to 24 volts. Well, we know that. We got that. 24 volt switch to contact the coil.
This is a load. So you've got to add two sides of power to it. Right? Isn't that how that works? And what's the switch do? It interrupts power. It interrupts power. Okay? It interrupts power. Or it makes power. Okay? Now up here is what we're going to get, what we need to look at today. I want you to see this. You know a contactor looks like this. You got two sets of contact going across it. Right? You have L1 and L2. T1 and T2. And underneath it, you have a coil that's 24 volts. This is normally open, this is normally open, double contact. So it looks like this. But it's turned sideways like this on a board. So we take this and bring it over here like this, with this, and that. And we're gonna put it over there. So this is the way we do it. We know we got a motor, okay? We got a compressor over here. And the compressor looks like this. And we got a start and a run. And a common. We're also going to have a run capacitor. Now we need to hook this up. But look what it said in the synopsis. CC1 and CC2 to compressor. So if we were looking at this contactor right here, this would be CC1 and CC2. The way this line drive diagram wants us to draw it out. Okay, is that right? Is that better light? Or is that better light? Or is this better light? What about this? That ain't no good. What about this? This? Okay. So now, oh no, that ain't good. There you go. Now, we're going to put our contacts in there, normally open, CC1. So we have to come over here and do this, like that. CC1, normally open. Now normally they don't, they don't always write normally open on there because they expect you to understand that. That's going to go to common. Now on a capacitor side, we also have to have that set of contacts. Do we not or do we do? We do. So let's go ahead and do. We're going to put this here with this here, and this is going to be CC2, normally open, which is right here. You still with me? You getting it? I want to show you what a contactor would look like in the real world. You would have L1, L2, T1, and T2, right? So let's take some of that off of that and simplify our contactor. This is what this looks like. That right there. So you had L1, L2, T1, T2. Can you see that? What's on that? Now. Let's go ahead and wire our motor the way you've been taught, the way you're supposed to do it. The run capacitor is in series with the run and the stall line. Then we're going to take the run and bring it through the other side of the contactor. Okay? 
So he just drew that like that. But let me ask you something. How would you write that on this board if I asked you to label it like this in your head? How would you figure that out to put it on this board? Well, remember, this is the load side and this is the voltage side coming in. Okay? So here we would have our what? That's going to common, and that side is going to the run on that particular one. So how would we do that? If this is common and this is run, we'd have to do it like that. The power is coming in on L1 side, and it's leaving the other side of voltage is hooked up here and here, so this side's hooked up over here, you have L2. Voila! And since you're going straight across it, L1 and T1, that's where common's hooked up. On this side, we'd have T2. Just like that. That's how you would hook that up, okay? Now, that's for that synopsis right there. But I wanted you to see how a contactor might look on a diagram you're going to see on a unit when you pull it off the unit. It's going to look like that. Looks like you can all see that. Magic hard lift. All right. Any questions about that? Hey, why'd you move seats again? Go sit back and go, what? Huh? What? Who's doing what? Okay. So this is the way this goes. Any questions about that so far? So you understand that so far. Okay, wow, that was just something else. Now, let's not make this too lengthy today. It's the first shot. So let's get back into the book. First, I'll erase all of this real quick. This doesn't blow your face. Like this. Put that up there. Come over here, erase all of this, erase all of that, like this, and like that, all right? I ordered a pizza for dinner last night. And when I picked it up, it was only cheese. I forgot to order the pepperoni. Isn't that just how life is? Now your book says, well yesterday we covered types of automatic controls on page 326. Today, we're on page 327. All right, we went all the way through devices that respond to thermal change. Now, let's go back to where we were. Uh, this paragraph right here, this, the first, second one, call it whatever you want. It's on the left-hand side in the top, 327. And look what it says. It says, the compressor in the refrigerator has a protective device that keeps it from overloading and damaging itself. This is called the overload. So right now, we're still on thermal devices that respond to thermal change. We're going to call this one number four. Thermal change devices, okay? Number four says overload. Now what that, what that uh, overload be doing is it says a protective device that keeps the compressor from overloading. It's an automatic control. 
it's an auto automatic, we'll write automatic instead of just auto so you don't get confused. Automatic control. Man, I this thing's recording. What's 20 minutes mean? So it says automatic control opens its contacts in the event that there's an overload or power problem. or an overload situation. Now look what it says. It says that one such example would be the power goes off and comes right back on while it's running. The overload control will open its contacts and prevent the compressor from operating until it's ready to go back to work again. Overloading often occurs when the refrigerator is low torque, fractional horsepower compressor, that means it's small. Okay, it's small. I'm gonna show you one, but it's holding up my camera. My uh, pad thing over there. Uh, we'll consider, we'll just call it your eyeball today. And it's trying to start against unequal pressures. Remember, there's a high side and a low side and the compressor's taking a depression differential between the low side and the high side. If it shuts off and tries to turn back on, it's trying to pump against that pressure. And look what it says. Overloading will occur when it tries to go to back to work again. It, will, it could even go into lock rotor amps. The overload control and then open its circuit protecting the compressor. After the compressor goes through a cool down period, the control resets and closes the circuit. Hopefully when pressures are near an equalization and the motor can start safely. So an overload thermal will protect the compressor in overload conditions, including lock rotor amps, and will shut it down. And once it cools, it, it has auto reset. The system overload control can be electric, thermal, or a combination of both. And the overload happens when the electric circuit is drawing more current than when it's designed for, due to electrical problems such as a short circuit, and proper electrical connections or faulty components, and on and on. Any questions about that? If you have any questions about any of this, you can send me an email, and I will respond to it. I don't know. I'll respond to it. Just joking. For example, let's say you want to overload the compressor. One way to do it is restricted air flow across the condenser coil. Yes, it happens. People don't have their condenser coils clean. They get dirty. It produces high head pressure requiring the compressor to work harder. Of course, this can lead to an overload condition. One small kind is a combination control of a small heater located with a bimetal element. When either an electrical or thermal overload occurs, the heater warps the bimetal and opens the circuit. That's in picture 13.2 and picture B on 327. That little bimetal that pops like this, you know? Now, some common automatic devices are temperature controls for refrigerator, fresh and frozen food, residential office cooling, water heaters, electric ovens, garbage fuses, circuit breakers, 
Automatic controls and air conditioning, some controls respond to temperature changes are used to monitor the overload. So let's talk about that there, by metal divider. By, do you know what by means? Okay, like a bicycle, right? Why do they call a bicycle by? Is it because it has two tires? Two pedals, two handles. Mine had two bells. I'm gonna leave it at that. I ain't gonna go the rest of the way. And it says, what is a bimetal device? Bi metal device. That means there's two of something. Two, the bimetal device is probably the most common used to detect thermal change. It's this, in its simplest form, it consists of two unlike metal strips. Two unlike metal strips. Often brass and steel. Each of these has a different rate of expansion and contraction with different rates of expansion and contraction. Now it says, each of these has a different rate of expansion contraction when heated and cool. When the device is heated, the brass expands faster than its steel, which causes the device to warp. This motion, we can use it for a useful task. Bimetal controls can be attached to an electrical component or a valve to stop, start, or modulate electrical current or fluid flow. There's your definition again. So if you look at picture 13.3, you can see the brass and the steel connected together like that. Bimetal controls are limited in application by the amount of warping it can do. I met a few people like that. For example, when the device is heated, the bimetal strip bends a certain amount per degree of temperature change. So let's see if we can get that to change. So what they do is they take that bimetal like that, like this, and they warp it this way, and they'll say it'll also warp this way. Now this is the same one, okay? This one's they showing you it's going this way or it can go this way. This is not three bimetal strips. It's one bimetal strip showing you it's going that way and showing you it's going this way. Is this too much for you? Do you need me to just draw one at a time? Well, you're in college, so let's make you handle it. So now, that one looks like that. which is still on this side, even if it bends that way. No, that's not an applicable illusion. So look what it says. 70 degrees, 75 degrees, and over here we got 65 degrees. So when it cools, one side contracts, when it heats the other side, right? Expands, and it bends. We can use that for something. Let's say over here we had some electrical contacts, okay? And we wanted it to touch. Okay, and here, It 
is the thing we want to touch or make contact. Well, you see, when it stands straight up, it won't touch it. All right? This thing's over here. Like that. Look. See? Him. Here. Him. Here. So when this bends, it will actually touch. And the circuit is made. So we can take bimetal and actually make a circuit. Okay, that's what they're telling you in this picture, uh, 13.4 and 13.5. And we'll draw in a little 13.6. To make bimetal devices practical over a wider temperature range, the strip is lengthened. A longer strip is normally carved into a circle shaped like a half pin and wound by a helix. The helix uses power to expand itself outward. So the helix looks something like this. Alright, and when you heat it up, the bimetal helix. Oh mama, you know. See when you heat it up like that, it'll do this. It'll go further out. So this might be your contact right here. And now they touch it. Reach out and touch another person's kind. So it goes back, just like that. Smack. Smack down on it. Now the rod and tube, let's look at that for a second. It's another type of control that uses unlike metals and the difference in the thermal and expansion and contraction. The rod and tube does what? It has an outer tube of metal with a high expansion rate, internal rod of metal with a low expansion rate. You can see it in picture 13.8. So what it does is it's like this, and they heat up the metal in the back of it, and it expands and pushes on the contact. That's the rod inside the tube. I want to go back for a second. They got some pictures of some other expansion. Uh, look at metal devices right there. Let's look at them for a second so you can understand each one of them. One of them, in picture 13.6 says, uh, letter A looks like this helix coil. Not this helix, but this helix. So when you heat it, oh my God, it's so tired. this happens right here. This, exp this starts to expand. And this could actually change something. Okay? That's what they used to use in all the thermostats with a the mercury ball. We, get, we haven't gotten to that page yet, but that's what they used, and we'll talk about that. Another form of helix is this one. It looks like this. And what happens is, is when you heat it, it goes like this. Well, it extends itself out to touch something. Them cats knew what they were doing when they figured all this out, didn't they? All right, any questions about the thermal helix or the thermal anything? Shoot me an email. Uh, I don't even know if you can shoot an email or where that term came from. How about this? Uh, send me an email. Now they have one on picture 1310, which is called a heat motor. It's like an accordion. It heats up and just does that. Look at the snap disc on page 330. It's another type of bimetal disc used to sense the temperature change in some applications. The control is treated as part of bimetal because its snap characteristic gives a quick open and close feature. So that's what that one does. Your contacts are like this. There's your contacts. Here are your bimetal discs. Just 
Okay? And what they're saying is, is when this warp it gets heated, like that, then it goes up like this and makes contact. That's how they draw it in your book. Now you got a circuit being continued. When it cools, it warps again, interrupts the circuit. No more power passing through. All right? Who said power passing through? That's how we fake power. The control is treated as part from the internal bimetal because of its snap characteristic. It's quick. Why is it quick? Can anybody answer that? Joel? Chance? No one? Okay. It's because when the power is passing through it and you interrupt the circuit or start the circuit, it could throw an arc. Well, the arc is what starts wearing it down, so you want it quick. The faster the snap action, where's my big red stick? The faster the snap action, the less arc you have and the longer the life of the part. Now let's talk about being controlled by fluid expansion on 331. Fluid expansion is another way to sense temperature change. It can be described as a column of temperature sensitive fluid rising and falling with a hollow stem in response to a sense temperature. It has a diaphragm in it, okay? So what they're saying is that you have this deal that looks like this and you picture it in your book right there. Um, to be more precise, we're gonna discuss picture 1313, 1314, 1359. That's right, I said 1313. Don't mean nothing. Okay, that's what it looks like in your book. And it's saying that the diaphragm, depending on the, the pressure of the fluid in it, can bend it. If it's heated, it can be expanded by it, or it can go back down if it's cool falling out. That's it. That's how that works. The diaphragm is nothing but a thin, flexible metal type disc with a large area. Pressure changes underneath the disc cause it to flex up and down, up and down, okay? So that's a fluid type expansion device. Fluid type expansion. All right, any questions about that? No? Very good, I can see y'all been studying. If you look at picture on page 1332, they actually show you a pretty good diaphragm of how they do something like this. They got a little bitty ball. Let's get rid of this one second. This will be the last thing you're going over today. Tomorrow, we'll start with thermal couples, thermal piles, and this chapter will be over, and we'll start 14. 14 is real heavy with thermostat wiring. So we'll do that the next couple days. Make sure you know how to wire up thermostats good. So in your book, it looks something like this. They got the little diaphragm like that that we just drew. And they got a tube coming down. And he's running over yonder here to a ball. Now the ball in the picture, the ball in the picture has fluid in it. Okay. Now here is where it's real cool. Look at what they did. They got a pivot on there, like this, and a set of contacts, like that. There's one wire for that side of the circuit, 
and whom's one wire going to that side of the circuit. Remember, this is all about trying to make circuits. So the metal's sitting here like this. But when we, this starts to heat up, this fluid starts to expand. And the pressure pushes up. Your book says in the first picture it's 30 PSI G. And now heated up, it's going to 40. At this time, this bends that diaphragm and pushes this up, which pushes this down. Making contact. That's how that looks in picture 33.2 right there. All right? Once the diaphragm is contracted, moving the interconnected linkage into opening electrical contact. All right? Pressure forces the diaphragm up and makes the electrical switch start the refrigeration equipment. And that's in that one right there. All right? That one is your, uh, it's showing you how ball pressure works for these. Remember, we're on automatic controls this week, so we're looking at all the kind of devices that do automatic Controlling. This is automatic. Now the next one they got in your book, the last one we're going to talk about today, is this one. It's a bellows. What's a bellows? Look at me now. Well, let me show you. Looks like this. I know. It looks like that hamburger you shouldn't eat the other day because it was too big. And it says. It does something like this. Now here's your here's your here's your palm. Now remember, you might have contacts up here, and it needs to make contact. All right, let's say you had contact here, and you had a contact here, and you need the two to touch. Well, you put your heat right here, like that, and now this is being heated up. Now, you put the pressure in there, the pressure goes up, and this thing expands. Okay? Like that. And those make contact. That's how an automatic bellows type work, your book says. 1317, the bellows is employed where more movement may be desirable than just a diaphragm. This thing can really get into some expansion, you understand? When more travel is needed, the bellows is the man for the job. It's much more like an accordion with a lot of internal volume and a lot of traveling space. All right? Now, uh, they also have the one uh, 1318. I forgot about that one. They got that one right there. Look at that picture right there. 1318, the remote bulb is partially filled on a board-on tube. The big thing about the board-on tube is it looks like this. All right, they got this little deal right here with the bulb coming up and coming around like this. Now what happens here is as the pressure builds in here, like this, and the heat comes on it like this, it gets heat in it, that pushes this open. Whereas it was once right here, now it's expanding outward. And that thing can make contact with something. And that's that one. That will conclude today's lesson. Please go do your essay. You have plenty of study guide notes and terms. I will make sure I take a picture of the study guide and term sheet for the people who weren't here yesterday to make sure you get a copy. I will also send you a copy of your handouts. 
so you'll have them up. Now, I expect you to stay in touch with me whenever I respond to you before 12 o'clock or whatever it is. I'll try to do it before 12, your normal class time. Um, we're going to try to get that Zoom app going, um, you know, because they may want me to go online only. They may want me to, they may agree with me that you like videos like this better. Um, I don't know. This is only for a short period of time, so nobody touches nothing. Uh, you don't touch people's whatever. You don't want to do that. And, um, you know, you go grab a door handle, and the next thing you know, you might be sneezing. <laughs> Take it seriously. The flu is out there. I just had a relative who was sanity, was um, sneezing, she was coughing, she got a high fever. She was laying in bed with a lot of baby, body aches. Sunday, her fever got really high. She felt really nauseous and sick. She got weak. Monday morning, she went to urgent care, and... Type A influenza. Yeah, doctor said 18 cases went through his office. Be careful of the flu, it's going around big time. All right, and of course the corona deal is going around too, you know. Uh, um, so just pay attention to whatever your um, government's saying and your leaders and do whatever they're saying to be safe. They'll give you a lot of precautions. Um, and stay in touch, tomorrow I'll have more of this. And I'll let you know the scoop of what's going on. Bye-bye.